Hello again. This is the second video in uh, Module 8, our race through the macroeconomic environment in which all of these millions of microeconomic decisions are taking place. In the first video, we looked at the different measurements that the government uses to see how the economy is doing. Production, GDP, the unemployment rate, and price stability using the consumer price index. So for this video, we're going to assume that we're concerned with one or more of those measurements. That for some reason, the markets left to their own have not given us the results that we're looking for. There's high unemployment there's price instability. Production has fallen um, and businesses are and factories are laying off workers and we're moving towards a recession or a slowdown. So this video deals with something called policy tools and policy tools generally are the the tools the um, the undertakings of the, the federal government and state governments can use in an effort to jumpstart manipulate, uh, tweak an economy in order to bring us to the levels of production, employment, or price stability that we're actually looking for. Now, in this section, if, if this was if this was a clear-cut uh, robotic type of situation and we could know exactly what to do in every case, uh, there wouldn't be any need for, uh, for economists anymore. There are different philosophies among politicians, among economists, among social scientists as to what is the best way to fix macro failure, the best way to bring us back to where, um, where th there's, a, there's a healthier social and economic um, society overall. These four, I'm, I'm going to present four different philosophies briefly. They all take place in our in our society at the same time sometimes working with one another and sometimes working against one another but the four different approaches we're going to consider are, are probably the four most popular today and they are fiscal policy monetary policy supply side policy and classical economic policy so first let's look at fiscal policy Fiscal policy is by far the most commonly used, most popular, and pretty much the default approach uh, that most, most industrialized governments around the world use in order to remedy economic ills. Fiscal policy, the word fiscal, does not just mean anything having to do with money. It actually is a very specific set of policy tools that government uses. The brain, uh, the brain behind fiscal policy was an economist named John Maynard Keynes, who was an economist to both the United Kingdom and the United States during the Great Depression. And the historical context is important, because during the Great Depression, what concerned most people were the lack of jobs. Unemployment at one point reached a high of 30 percent. So. Keynes steps into the Great Depression, and he steps into a world where the most important thing to do is, for an economist is to come up with a remedy for the lack of jobs, and that is what he did in developing what we now call fiscal policy. In, in approaching fiscal policy, Keynes used something called an aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, which I'm going to show you in a second. Since you've already been through the module on supply and demand, um, you understand how the basic supply and demand model works. In looking at a grand national societal economy, what Keynes did was basically take the demand for all goods and services in the economy and roll it into one enormous demand curve called aggregate demand. And he took the supply curve for all goods and services in the economy and rolled it into one supply curve called aggregate supply. Now, the vertical axis in our supply and demand model is normally price. 
What does it sound like if we're talking about the overall level of prices of all supply and all demand in an economy? Well, that's the equivalent of the consumer price index, price levels. The horizontal axis is quantity, the quantity of goods being bought or sold. But what does it sound like if we're talking about the quantity of all goods and all services, not just a single one? Well, that's the equivalent of GDP, which is a measure of all the goods and services being created in the economy. So, what Keynes also, uh, actually, uh, as we use another economist, Arthur Oaken, uh, discovered, there is a direct correlation between GDP levels and employment levels. When GDP increases, employment increases. When GDP falls, employment falls. Therefore, we end up with a model using our, our basic supply and demand model. Now, you've got more lines on here than you're normally used to seeing. The price axis is price, but for everything, so CPI. The quantity axis represents not just GDP, but also employment. If you look to that equilibrium, Keynes said the basic equilibrium of supply and demand will give you a certain price level and a certain quantity of both production and employment. If aggregate demand should shift to the left, if this should, if this should shift over that way, that would give you lower prices and lower levels of employment. And that is exactly what was happening during the Great Depression. Therefore, Keynes argued that the way to fix the economy was to find ways to shift aggregate demand to the right. And that's what you see AD2, this curve right here. By shifting aggregate demand to the right, you go from that equilibrium to that equilibrium. That second equilibrium gives you a higher level of prices, which of course in the Great Depression people were not particularly concerned about because prices had already fallen, but it also gives a greater level of employment and production, which is what they were looking for. So, using this basic model, Keynes argued if you could shift demand to the right, you could create more jobs and employment. For many, um, for presidents, for congressional leaders, that is the entire purpose of a stimulus package. If you can put more money in the economy, if you can get people spending, then they can pull demand for goods and services to the right, and businesses can feel relieved that there is actually demand for their goods, and start hiring people again, and that basically is how this model is supposed to work. So. Keynes said, look, the way to fix the economy is to get money spent in, in that economy. Get it circulating. Get it moving. So basically, he came up with three different mechanisms that government uses still today, a century later, to stimulate the economy. The first were tax cuts for consumers, with the idea that if consumers had more money in their pockets, they would end up spending it. And in fact, in recent history, when there have been tax rebate checks sent out to the American public, we know from looking at retail sales that in fact, they do spend a great deal of that money, though not all of it. The second tool he said to use was to, get, to increase transfer payments. Transfer payments are payments to individuals for which nothing is required in return. In general, welfare, unemployment, social security, any type of payment that puts money in the hands of people who don't have disposable income, because that will enable them to spend and create demand within the economy. And then, the third tool he said to use was to use government spending, increase government spending, because when the government starts spending money on um, on projects, it puts people to work and creates demand in the economy.
And so under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, there was an entire um, set of, of plans and projects to put people to work. The Civilian Conservation Corps, the building of dams, the uh, hiring of people at the Army Corps of Engineers, the building of roads, the electrification of the South through the damming of the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway. All of these programs designed to put money back into the economy. Kane's basic approach was to say, borrow money now, because after all, the government would be giving money away in the form of tax rebates and transfer payments and, um, and increased government spending. But where does all that come from? Borrow now. When the economy writes itself, then you be can begin to pull back on some of that government spending, increase taxes a bit, you will receive additional revenues because of the additional people working, and then you can pay off what you have borrowed. It hasn't necessarily worked that way. In fact, our national debt now stands at almost $15 trillion. But in, an, in Keynes's mind, if government would follow that particular approach, you wouldn't end up with a $15 trillion debt because you would borrow when you needed and then pay it back as times got better. Now, in order to do this, and this is one of the major criticisms of fiscal policy, the government really does borrow. They borrow trillions upon trillions of dollars. Who do they borrow it from? Well, they borrow it from large corporations that have that amount of money to lend in the first place. They borrow it from foreign governments that have amassed that amount of dollars. They even borrow from the Social Security Administration. Government rarely pays the principal back on these loans or bonds. Rather, they simply borrow from someone else to pay back the first loan so that there is a constant rollover and an increase in the debt. However, what they do have to pay in the meantime is the interest on the debt. And depending on whose figures you believe, at this point, the interest that the United States government pays on the debt could be as much as 20 cents on every tax dollar received. And this becomes a critical issue in understanding the problem with deficit spending. And it's not that deficit spending is evil in and of itself, because we all engage in deficit spending when we borrow money for a car, for school tuition, or for a house, or when a government decides there's an emergency um, situation uh, downtown and a bridge needs to be rebuilt. You borrow money to rebuild the bridge and you pay, you pay it back over time. But the problem is the American taxpayer pays the interest on the debt on a regular basis so that the citizenry is paying interest on the debt and who receives the interest? Well, those who lent to the government. Large corporations, foreign governments, foreign banks, large investment houses. Um, so you actually do have a structural situation where wealth is transferred from the citizenry to entities that are already are large and wealthy and wealthy enough to be able to lend that type of money um, to the federal government. That's a major, um, a major criticism of fiscal policy and the fact that um, government doesn't seem to pay back when times, times get better. Nonetheless, this is the number one form of, of policy tool used by just about every government around the world when there is a drop in employment or a drop in production. It's called a stimulus package or a fiscal stimulus and is always designed to increase spending in the economy. Now, one of the criticisms of this, as we'll see later, in addition to deficit spending, is that it may provide false signals to the marketplace. As government does a whole bunch of spending really quick, it gives businesses the, um, the notion that, ah, happy times are here again. We can begin making goods. We can begin hiring people because there's demand. But then, when and if that money dries up, they find themselves almost in a worse position than when they started because now they created goods and services for people who really don't have the disposable income to purchase them anymore, and they find themselves possibly 
in worse condition than when they started. Sort of a hangover effect. So, that's fiscal policy. The second set of policy tools that is used by the government are monetary policy tools. Now, monetary sounds like fiscal. The words, when we speak in, in general English, it means something very different. Monetary policy tools are designed to take economic policy out of the hands of Congress and President and politicians and instead to use a professional banking system to implement economic policy. And so monetary policy is a series of policy tools that is implemented by the Federal Reserve System, which is a, a system that un up until recently many Americans were really not all that familiar with, but has become much more in the public limelight um, since the, the bailouts of some of the major financial industries and as, uh, the um, appointment of Ben Bernanke as the head of the Federal Reserve because he's uh, much more um, public with what the Fed is doing, um, much more willing to have press conferences than some of his predecessors were. And so some of the cloak of, of mystery has begun to be removed from this Federal Reserve System and many more people are now talking about it. Federal Reserve System is um, has multiple levels to it. At the bottom level the entire nation is divided up into 12 regional banking districts, Federal Reserve districts. And the private banks, the individual banks within that district, technically own the Federal Reserve Bank in that district and elect directors to that particular bank. So there's a Federal Reserve Bank in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Minneapolis, Dallas, um, Atlanta, St. Louis, San Francisco, and the whole nation's divided into these 12 districts. And these Federal Reserve Banks are given basically monopoly power by the federal government to engage in certain tasks. At the very top of the Federal Reserve System is a seven-member board of governors that oversees the entire system. These seven governors are appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate for terms of 14 years, with only one member being up every two years. And the system was designed that way to prevent it from being very subject to political manipulation or sudden political upheaval um, or changes in Congress. Uh, it was meant, it was designed to keep it somewhat separate from the political process. Um, and there's, there's, of course, discussion and controversy as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. In any event, there are these seven members who oversee, overall, the system, and the current chair is Ben Bernanke, as I, I, as I stated. But the decision-making authority within the Federal Reserve System is not with the 12 regional banks, nor is it with the seven-member Board of Governors at the top. The real decision-making authority lies in a level in the middle called the Open Market Committee. The Open Market Committee is, consists of the seven governors as well as five rotating bank presidents from the regional banks, with one exception. The president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank always sits on the Open Market Committee. So in reality, it's the seven governors, the president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, and then four other regional presidents who rotate their terms. It is this body that actually makes the, the policy tool decisions, the regulatory decisions, that affect so much of daily life in the banking world and in our macroeconomic environment. The tools of the Federal Reserve are the following. First, most commonly one reported in the press is the discount rate. The discount rate is the interest rate that 
the Federal Reserve System charges member banks for borrowing money from it. It's very, very possible that your local bank may want to make loans to, uh, to businesses who have, um, who have big construction projects or to, uh, to local individuals who want uh, mortgage loans or small business loans, but they may not have all the money available just from the deposits within their local bank. So they borrow money from the Federal Reserve System. If the Federal Reserve increases the interest rate that it charges member banks, then member banks are going to have to up the interest rate they charge businesses and individuals from borrowing from it. If they increase the interest rate that potential borrowers will be charged, that discourages spending. That would be called a monetary restraint. If the Federal Reserve Bank wants to restrain the economy, which sometimes they do, because unlike the Keynesians, who are, who are concentrating on fixing an unemployment problem, monetarists tend to be much more concerned with the possibility of inflation taking off. So sometimes they work in opposition to each other. Not always, but sometimes. They will raise the discount rate, which will end up raising interest rates as a general market effect that, are, that is charged out in the market to businesses and individuals, and that will discourage borrowing and therefore discourage spending. On the other hand, if the Federal Reserve System wants to increase spending because they're on the same page with the Keynesians and they want to kickstart an economy by increasing demand in the economy, then they will lower the discount rate. Therefore, when banks borrow from the Fed to increase their funds, they'll be paying a low rate and they, in turn, can charge a lower rate to customers which will encourage borrowing and therefore spending on new decks, a pool, a vacation, uh, a new school loan, uh, a housing addition, and increased demand in the economy. The second tool that the Federal Reserve can use, which they don't change that often, is the reserve ratio. And the reserve ratio is the amount of money that banks must keep on hand in the bank. It's currently 10%. And that's to prevent a run on the banks, which has happened many times in American history before. If they increase the reserve ratio, if they said to banks you must keep 15% on hand instead of 10%, that would mean less money would be available for those banks to actually loan out that would increase interest rates. That would discourage spending. That would be a restraint. If they wanted to encourage borrowing and spending, the Fed could lower the reserve ratio and say from now on banks only have to have 5% of their deposits on hand. That would give the banks more cash to lend and hopefully encourage more spending. Of course the danger there is that at a time when many banks are in trouble or failing or have uh, taken part in questionable uh, risk-taking and investments, do you want to say to a bank you can even have less cash on hand than before? Probably not. So in the current climate, this is not a tool that the Federal Reserve is going to be able to very successfully use. The third tool that the Federal uh, Reserve uses and they use it on a regular basis every day it are, it are something called open market operations and that refers to the buying and selling of bonds usually at the New York Federal Reserve Bank and this is done on a daily basis if the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank announces that they are buying bonds from the public at a premium. In other words, if you hold a government bond, 
and expect a 7% return. And the Federal Reserve announces that they will buy that bond from you. And if you, if you do that now, you'll actually make 7.25%. It actually makes sense to cash your bond in. If you cash your bond in, then the Federal Reserve System is putting cash in your hand. What are they hoping? They're hoping you will spend that and stimulate the economy. On the other hand, if they want to restrain the economy, they want to take cash out of the economy to keep people from spending it because they're afraid of inflation taking off. They will offer to sell bonds at a good price to the public. And that means they'll be giving the public a piece of paper that says IOU, a certain amount of money in the future. And in return, they'll be taking money out of the public hands as the public buys these bonds. Now, when I say the public, I generally don't mean you and me. I mean major financial, financial institutions that are buying and selling bonds in the hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe even billions of dollars. And this is something the Fed does every single day on the floor of the New York Federal Reserve Bank in order to put more money and to inject money into the economy and increase demand or to pull money out um, in order to restrain demand. At the current time that this video is being created in 2012, both those who follow fiscal policy and those who follow monetary policy are striving to increase demand in a struggling economy and they're both on the same page. The Federal Reserve System has also found itself involved in a new tool, if you'd like to call it that, in the recent years, and that has been the bailout of banks. Uh, programs such as the Troubled Asset Relief Program or Quantitative Easing are some of the programs you may have heard about. In essence, they are ways to inject cash into the banking system once the large banks realized that they had made bad investments, that they were short on cash, they couldn't cover um, all of the liabilities they had, and the Federal and the Federal Reserve System stepped in to bail out those those banks. So, criticisms of the Federal Reserve. Well, criticisms of the bailout itself. This is an incredibly powerful institution. It is very much insulated from political involvement. On the good side, that prevents political manipulation of the banking system, and on the downside, that prevents a lot of political oversight of this system, which has spent a lot of taxpayer dollars to keep large banks and large financial institutions afloat. There is, beyond a doubt, a, a incestual relationship between those who are involved in the Federal Reserve those who are involved in the on the national level in the New York Bank and some of America's largest financial institutions. It is not unusual to see employees of Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan Chase or Citibank moving out of those private banks and into the Federal Reserve system and and back and forth. And so that's a major criticism of this uh, of this very powerful economic engine in the American society. Of course, another criticism simply is that they're not always that effective. Um, sometimes interest rates are already so low that lowering the discount rate has no additional effect whatsoever. And that's a problem that we actually see right now. So that's monetary policy. A third set of policy tools can best be described as supply-side policy. Now, supply-side policy has been a political lightning rod by both supporters and detractors of this set of policy tools. And I think we need to understand the, the purposes and the rationale behind it and the full scope of it in order to make a, a, a full judgment. So, 1970s, and again, all of this has historical context. In the 1970s, we had an event, uh, we had a, a phenomenon called stagflation. During that time, inflation increased, but we also lost jobs at the same time. 
Normally that does not happen. During the Great Depression, you'll, we lost jobs, but prices fell. During the stagflation of the 1970s, prices rose even as people were losing jobs. It was a different phenomenon. And many economists looked at this as not being a problem with demand, but being a problem with supply, thus the name supply-side economics. So, using another sheet. If supply, AS1, was to shift to the left, that would explain higher prices and lower employment. Therefore, supply-siders argued, if you can shift supply to the right, as I've indicated on this graph, you can go from that first equilibrium to a second equilibrium, and that second equilibrium results in lower prices and more employment. So if a shift of supply to the left brings you the worst of both worlds, a shift in supply to the right can bring you the best of both worlds, lower overall prices and higher employment at the same time. Of course, supply-side policy um, was um, largely articulated by uh, a Republican congressman from Buffalo, Jack Kemp, and Ronald Reagan, when he ran for president, campaigned on this, um, on this set of policy tools and has been so closely associated with supply-side policy that supply-side policy is often called Reaganomics. The basic tenets of supply-side policy are these. Since we want to shift the supply curve to the right, we simply look at the determinants of supply and apply them on a national broad level. So, supply siders argued for tax cuts for business, not for consumers in order to generate demand and spending, but tax cuts for business in order to lower cost to business and shift supply to the right. They also argued for deregulation of business. Now, deregulation took two different forms. One form meant uh, was what it sounds like, having fewer regulations on business, fewer workplace regulations, fewer um, environmental regulations, uh, fewer reporting and taxing regulations, which also would lower cost for business, and generally had support from from one segment of Congress. The other form of deregulation generally received support by different members of Congress, and that was revoking monopoly status for certain businesses. We saw the breakup of one national telephone company, Ma Bell, into the Baby Bell companies. We saw the deregulation of the airline industry which meant that specific airlines were no longer guaranteed a monopoly right to fly between two cities, but additional airlines were allowed to compete for the right to fly between those, um, between those places. And um, quite frankly, at that point, you saw the birth of a lot of small, low-cost airlines, such as Southwest Air, coming into, coming into existence and, um, and taking a large part of the market share as they were now able to compete. A third tool, um, which generally had support by both Republicans and Democrats in Congress from both sides of the aisle, is something called human capital investment. The idea being, if you made labor more efficient, that would overall be a lowering of cost to business. When cost is lowered, supply shifts to the right. And so human capital investment takes many different forms educational reform, which is a topic that is still with us today and still highly controversial, because while many people believe in educational reform, very few people can agree on what form that should take. Teacher testing, student testing, charter schools, um, expanding homeschool um, opportunities, um, all uh, the No Child Left Behind Act which was a, um, a Republican effort, and a race to the top, which was uh, an effort by President Obama. Uh, 
So that particular effort at having some sort of national educational improvement is actually part of the supply side approach to improving the skills and efficiency of labor. Also part of that were uh, jobs training program, the, the trend to move away from welfare and into work fair programs, um, and, and other types of programs designed to help people retrain and retool. And of course, if structural unemployment is one of the problems being experienced, then jobs training programs might be exactly what the doctor ordered to, to help match unemployed labor with employers seeking workers. The last um, tool used by the supply siders, and again this received support from both sides of the political aisle, was infrastructure. The building of infrastructure. And this is one of those places where traditionally fiscal policy adherents and supply siders were able to agree. By building of infrastructure, I mean the building of new roads, ports, um, intermodal facilities, which was a big byword in the 80s and the 90s for combining uh, transportation centers where rail and train and airlines and, and marine shipments could all meet together. Fiscal policy adherents supported these because they saw it as a uh, way to increase government spending, a way to increase demand in the economy through government spending, and they may have also supported it for for other social, environmental, uh, and other reasons. Supply sider supported it because they understood that if our transportation system was more efficient, here it comes again, that would lower costs for business. All businesses need to move goods and services from place to place. If you could lower cost for business, you could shift supply to the right. So you have fiscal policy people seeing this as a way to shift demand to the right, and supply siders seeing it as a way to shift supply to the right, both with the end result of increasing production and increasing jobs and employment. So, those are the tenets of supply side policy. And as you can see, fiscal, monetary, and supply side policy tend to all take place at the same time and to different degrees have pretty much crossed party lines um, in both their, their supporters and their detractors. Now one of the, detraction, uh, one of the criticisms of supply side policy is, um, is what we call trickle down economics. And many people have viewed supply side policy um, negatively because of this notion of trickle down. The idea that if you give businesses tax breaks and make things easier for business, that this will some down, somehow trickle down to the rest of us. Well, we've seen that sometimes you give tax breaks or lower cost to business, that doesn't necessarily mean that business will take that money and then reinvest it in the economy. They may in reinvest it offshore. They may use it to invest in stock market gambling, which doesn't necessarily create any jobs whatsoever but simply gives them capital gains, additional profit at a lower tax rate. Even if it does trickle down to workers uh, through increased employment or better benefits or um, uh, higher, higher salaries for labor, it doesn't happen equally. So that if you engage in fiscal policy and send everyone a tax rebate check of $500, we know that everyone in the country gets a tax rebate of $500, and that, um, from a sense of, of equality and fairness, Americans tend to, to like that. With trickle-down theory, not everyone gets an extra $500. <clears throat> Businesses that use that money to invest in their employees, um, those employees may do quite well. Businesses that don't, well, their employees may suffer. So it, it, it doesn't affect everyone down on the ground equally. And there's no way, at least in the current um, state, to ensure that that happens. Because when businesses make more money, there's no provision that requires them to share that money 
with labor or to increase uh, their share of health benefits or increase salary or anything else like that. So, again, you've got these three sets of very proactive policy tools and sometimes they cross different sides of the aisle. One of the criticisms of um, the Federal Reserve System, for example, in monetary policy has been that it's, it has never been audited. Well, you have on one side Ron Paul, a Republican congressman, and on another side Bernie Sanders, a, an independent and essentially socialist senator from Vermont, on the same page on that issue. And so sometimes the economic issues and the economic policy tools are not clear-cut Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. Even though the media and during a political election, often the politicians themselves jump on some of these issues as if they were. And traditionally, the economic policy differences don't line up precisely with political policy differences. So we've looked at three so far, fiscal, monetary, and supply, and I left one for last because it is the probably the most different of all of them. And when I say different, I mean it rejects the notion that government should be doing anything. And this is called neoclassical or classical economics. It has its roots in Adam Smith and free market capitalism, in Frederick Bastiat uh, from Revolutionary France and from some others. So let's turn our attention to classical policy. Classical, classical economists um, generally go by a number of different schools, a number of names, the Chicago School, the Austrian School. They pretty much all mean the same thing. And some names you may have heard associated with it um, in addition to Smith or Bastiat might be uh, Milton and Rose Friedman or uh, Friedrich von Hayek. Uh, von Hayek is probably the most uh, critical one because he spent his entire life attempting to refute John Maynard Keynes um, because he just believed that government involvement in the economy was a disaster in the making. And the classical economist basically says that when government gets involved in the economy it sends false signals and ends up creating greater problems down the road than actually solving them. And to the classical economist, they would rather see the normal forces of supply and demand work themselves out and go through a little temporary pain rather than try to put band-aids on problems that are only going to get worse down the road. That's, that, that's um, pretty much a, a summation of, of a classical approach. And classical economists have come up with a number of theories and a number of scenarios to try and explain why, as good intentioned as it might be, government efforts often fail and may even make things worse. So, one of these theories is called capture theory. Capture theory is the, is the idea that a vested interest will always capture the regulatory agency that is designed to regulate it and then they will use it for their own advantage so one of the best examples I can offer of that is you're probably aware right now that uh, an American cannot obtain pharmaceuticals from Canada the stated reason for this is that we can't be assured of the quality of Canadian drugs. And um, the FDA and the federal government doesn't want to see Americans harmed by, by drugs that may be unsafe. If you believe in capture theory, you would say, nonsense. That's not the reason we're not allowed to import uh, Canadian drugs. The reason we're not allowed to import Canadian drugs is because large American pharmaceutical companies have captured the agency and are now using it to its own benefit. And you can see this when you look at the number of employees who used to work in pharmaceutical companies who now work in the FDA and vice versa. Capture theory says, look, the general public says that it's important that their pharmaceuticals be safe, but very few people in the American public 
know who the head of the FDA is or where they're located or their address or their phone number or the administrative assistance name or even what's on the agenda the majority of Americans the vast majority of Americans have never written to the FDA or testified at the FDA when it came to approving or disapproving a particular drug but do you think that pharmaceutical companies know all of those things know the secretary's name know their favorite restaurants know who's moving where and know the agenda and when to be there and when to show up and when to testify of course they do because for them the benefits of knowing all of that outweighs the cost to them of knowing all that therefore they engage in lobbying they engage in engaging the agency itself and eventually capture the agency so capture theory suggests that while government regulation of industry might be a good idea from the public's perspective the reality is the public will then be apathetic towards what that agency does allowing vested large vested interests to capture that agency and use it on its behalf a second criticism of government involvement in the economy is called public excuse me sorry we just got a mosquito in our eye <coughs> it's called <coughs> public choice theory public choice theory attempts to explain the incentives and disincentives that go into government decision making and how it's different in the government sector than in the private sector and I want to be very clear here they're not saying that government is evil or bad or full of terrible employees what they are saying is that incentives are different and since human beings respond to incentives and disincentives there are going to be different results I'll give you an example if a company is hired to fill potholes in the road and they're told we will give you ten thousand dollars to do this job the private industry has an incentive to keep their costs low because by keeping their costs low they increase their profit on the other hand when government takes that job they do not necessarily have an incentive to keep costs low in fact very often a government office has an incentive to increase costs because that level of cost will help determine next year's budget in other words by increasing cost they can hope to increase their revenue the following year I've worked in a number of government offices it is extremely common at the end of the fiscal year to get a memo and to be told hey you've got X number of dollars left in your budget with the implication you better spend it now because if you don't you're gonna lose it and if you don't spend your entire budget this year we're not going to give you the same amount next year so public choice theory suggests that with the warp in incentives that are, it's different in government than in private industry private industry will be more efficient at undertaking a project than uh, the government sector because of those incentives and disincentives and finally one important um, issue that neoclassical economists would raise is the issue of distorted incentives probably not an insurance company on the planet would be willing to insure a house that was built on a barrier beach especially one that was prone to hurricanes in this case the insurance company and environmentalists would be on the same page it doesn't make sense to build a huge house on a beach that is designed by nature to move back and forth with ocean storms however when the federal government steps in and uses tax money to subsidize a flood insurance program to make it lucrative to make it possible for insurance companies to insure these type of houses they have created a, a, an incent a, a distorted incentive 
the government has now entered into the economy. Yes, it'll help build houses on a barrier beach, but is that something we want to do? Probably not. Overall, in the economy, we know that when government steps in and purchases many goods and services, it sends a signal to the economy, as I stated earlier, that consumers are willing to buy again because there's an increase in demand for goods and services. And businesses may get excited, ramp up production, and try to meet this growth in demand, only to find that when that government program ends or the money it drops and is spent somewhere else that all of a sudden they have excess inventories no way to sell them and things get worse it as I said earlier the hangover effect now of course there are many criticisms of the neoclassical position as well um, that doing nothing is not a um, is not necessarily responsible because people are suffering and there are things government can do to help but you've got all four sets of these approaches playing out in the political world. The fiscal, the monetary, the supply side, and the classical. And if you've come to the conclusion here that one size does not fit all, and one approach is not the panacea for everything, you're probably right. Um, and this is one of the reasons why economics on a macro level is so difficult um, and is, is so difficult to implement and so difficult to predict the outcome. The best laid plans of mice and men oft times go astray. That's our second video, and um, we look forward to meeting you again with the third. Thanks.